My name is Randy Howell, and you're listening to the Faith and Fishing Podcast. Welcome to the Faith and Fishing Podcast, where every episode I'll bring you an interview with a member of the fishing community, and they'll be sharing their faith stories and fishing memories with you. I'm your host, Cam Steele. Hey y'all, welcome back to the Faith and Fishing Podcast. Um, just a few housekeeping things before we jump into the episode. Uh, we are still uh, taking entries for the uh, the giveaway for hitting that 5,000 listener mark or the 5,000 listens mark, total downloads, whatever you want to call it. Um, so jump on over to the Instagram at Faith and Fishing Pod or uh, Faith and Fishing over on Facebook and find that find that um, that uh, that post and comment your your favorite episode so far and uh, that will get you entered into the the giveaway. You'll get um, a gift card from Jay's Jigs, a uh, prize pack from uh, Mr. B. Lure Company, and one of the uh, Faith and Fishing shirts. Um, so head on over and and do that. Um, we will be doing a live a live stream stream either on uh, Facebook and YouTube or over on Instagram. I haven't decided yet, but uh, to announce winners for that. Uh, we also um, wanted to remind you guys about the new merch. Um, so we have a new uh, T-shirt design that says, Hey, y'all, um, and then Faith and Fishing Podcast on the back. And then we've made some changes to some uh, some of the older designs and added a few new colors and stuff like that. So um, that is all I have for um, for the um you know the the housekeeping stuff so uh let's go ahead and get our guest introduced right after this save your outdoors gives me confidence that no matter what happens what i take on the water is coming back home with me with retrieval devices for fishing rods bow fishing bows action cams and even one that can be attached to your other gear they've got your whole arsenal covered when one of these devices goes in a drink, it releases a float attached to your gear by 60 feet of line so you can get it back, and the pressure sensitive filter means that you don't have to worry about rain or dips in the water while landing a fish. At SaveYourOutdoors.com, that's S-A-V-U-R Outdoors.com, you can use promo code FNFP15 to save 15% and try them for yourself. Atollus, based out of Charleston, South Carolina, is an eyewear accessory and gear company focused on enhancing your time on the water. Their floating sunglass retainers are the most technically advanced around. Over five years of engineering, testing, and exhaustive feedback from paddlers, anglers, and watermen have resulted in a patented design in a class of its own. They're incredibly light and comfortable, built for durability, sport a sleek, minimal design, float virtually all brands and models of sunglasses, and they're back for life. So if you break them, Atollus will replace them, no questions asked. Whether you're fishing, kayaking, or boating, Atollus will save your shades from the dream. Head on over to A-T-O-L-L-A-S dot C-O to check out their gear and use promo code FAITHINFISH15, that's FAITH, the letter N, FISH, the number one, five, at checkout to save 15% on your order. Last week, the episode dropped, but recently I had the pleasure of being the guest on uh, the Stopping to Think podcast, which is an awesome podcast about, uh, it's with Will Dole. It's about his thoughts on the Bible, theology, culture, books, and whatever else is making him think. And it was an awesome time. And the links to listen uh, for that will be in the All Things Faith and Fishing link in the show notes. Um, now, I say that here in this section instead of the housekeeping section, uh, because Will was kind enough to join us on this podcast uh, to talk about his faith journey. And as it would turn out, he's even a little bit of a fisherman. So uh, in addition to hosting the Stopping to Think podcast, Will is also the pastor of uh, Remsen Bible Fellowship. And along with his wife, was recently accepted as a missionary with the uh, Rural Home uh, Ministry Association. That is one of the hardest words ever to say. So forgive me for that. But he loves the outdoors, reading, and spending time with his family. Uh, Will, man, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Ken, for having me. Absolutely, man. So to get us started, why don't you go ahead, introduce yourself to our listeners, and tell us who Will Dole is. Uh, yeah, so I mean, you, you read in the, the intro there, I'm 
pastor Remsen Bible Fellowship. We're a small church plant. Uh, we're just about to hit three years of meeting as a church here in Remsen, uh, just a small town in Northwest Iowa. Actually, it's my wife's hometown. I grew up in Idaho, uh, rural North Idaho. Rural is a little bit of a hard word to say. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, so we just, we just joined the Rural Home Missionary Association here last year. Um, so we had planted this church uh, about three years ago and I was still working full-time for the post office. I worked for the U S postal service for 13 years. Um, and it was getting to the point where trying to juggle two full-time jobs was, was getting to be a little much. And so we were just looking for avenues. We live in a, a small town, about 1700 people, uh, ways to support ourselves financially while at the same time, being able to pour more time into ministry and getting to meet people here in town uh, and develop some evangelistic relationships and uh, just get to know people. So we joined RHMA through whom we're able to, to raise support as mis- missionaries. And then uh, also we just started a coffee shop. So we started Fat Annie's Coffee Stop. We opened up about six weeks ago. So that's uh, that's kind of where we're at. Yeah, we've got four kids in ages nine down to two, which is an absolute blast. Um, <laughs> yeah, sure. So that's a, that's a little bit about who I am. That's awesome. So I want to ask about the, the coffee shop. So do uh, you kind of do you have your own uh, own blend that you you use as your your house blend or is there a particular uh, particular one out there that that you find better than all the rest? You know, we talked about doing a blend and actually I am a huge fan of Costa Rican coffee. Uh, so we just run a straight Costa Rican medium roast is, and that's what we use for everything. Our cold brew, our drip coffee, our espresso, all of it. We run uh, just straight Costa Rican. I mean, we do flavored blends and stuff for people too, but, uh, that's, that's what we run. Most everything is, is Costa Rican coffee. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. I, I do love a good cold brew. Um, Mm -hmm. so I, uh, I wish that more places, uh, did a, did a good cold brew. So, yeah, for sure. So um, let us uh, kind of give us an idea of. You said the uh, that Remsen uh, Bible Fellowship was a was a plant that's been there for you said three years. Yeah. Um, what is the what is the process of planting a church like? Oh boy, uh, I can tell you all the ways not to do it. <laughs> so I mean, there's a lot of a lot of literature out there from the last twenty or so years. Uh, I mean, obviously, churches have been planting churches for two thousand years now. <laughs> it's it's not exactly a new thing, uh, but on the other hand, it, it really kind of enjoyed a renaissance starting in the the eighties and the nineties, and and really, I mean, honestly, kind of became like the sexy thing to do in the early two thousands. Uh, which is when I became aware of it and got interested. Uh, But most of that literature, and this is starting to change here in the last five to 10 years, but most of the literature that's out there is for urban areas or, or suburban areas like, and we're, we're in a small town. And so there isn't a lot out there on how to plant in a small church. And especially when I started doing a lot of my reading six, seven years ago, there just wasn't much there, but for what, what we did, I can just tell our story, I guess. Uh, it's not necessarily how I'd advise anybody to do it. But we when we moved to Iowa, uh, so I grew up in North Idaho, like I said, and when we got married, that's where we were living. And I worked part-time out there for uh, a parachurch ministry where we worked with small rural churches, helping them establish youth ministries and just train the lay people in their churches to do that. But that was a missionary position and I was awful at fundraising. So we weren't making very much money doing that. And I was working part time for the postal service. And this was in the years following the financial crash. And so I wasn't making any money doing that. And so we wound up moving to Iowa just because there was a lot more job opportunity. But one of the things that I had talked with some of the contacts I had out here about was church planting in this town in particular of Remsen was, was a place where, one guy I knew his, his church was looking, had been looking to plant a church there. They prayed about it for years and just hadn't had anybody that they really wanted to, to take the reins on that. Um, and when we moved to Iowa, the that's actually the church that we wound up getting plugged in with was that church. And after we'd been there for about a year and a half, two years, I went to the board of elders and said, Hey, this town I think needs another church. Um, I think our church has the resources to do it. And if nobody else wants to, take the reins. Uh, I'll do it. I mean, I'm like 24 at the time. And they, I think they kind of, they, they all smiled and nodded and said, yeah, we'll pray about that. Will. And I think as soon as I left the room, they probably laughed. Like, what is this guy thinking? We don't hardly know him. Um, 
And so actually I, I went through kind of a long process. I, I don't have, uh, I'm in the process of getting some formal education, but I don't have like any formal theological education. Uh, and so like, I could see why they were like, I don't know that we really want to trust this guy to do something, invest a bunch of time and, and resources in this. So I, I spent a lot more time just serving in the church and then serving uh, with ministries in the community, Youth for Christ, um, and, and a local uh, homeless shelter preaching down there and doing a lot of pulpit supply and stuff. Anyway, after several years, came back to the elders with an actual plan and said, hey, uh, here's what I think this would look like, and, and here's a plan for doing it. And so what we, we did was we actually started a Bible study over here um, and with, so the, the town that we're in is only about a 15 minute drive to the church that we were in. Uh, but it, it is a separate town. And so you get kind of that people aren't going to drive necess- If, if you are the type of person who already wants a certain type of church, yes, you'll drive to it, but unchurched people aren't necessarily driving to the next town over to find a church or, or people that are, you know, in one faith, aren't going to like start looking towns over anyway. Uh, we, we just felt like it was really important to have a church here. And so we started a Bible study with some of the folks from our sending church that were already in this town. And this is one of the things I probably wouldn't do the same way if we did it again. But that's what we did. And we, we had a pretty good group of folks getting together every week. And we decided after about a year, we need to transition into meeting on Sunday mornings. And then actually what happened at that point was most of the people decided we're going to stay with the mothership. <laughs> And so we wound up with a really small core of just 11 people uh, to, to start off on Sunday mornings. And um, we, we've seen some slow growth and kind of ups and downs over the course of the three years. It's been honestly kind of topsy turvy six months after we started COVID hit. And so, you know, we're right. online online for five, six weeks and then we're meeting, doing like drive up church for six weeks. And it, it was it was crazy. Um our, our town's a very traditional town, uh, and yeah, I, I don't know exactly what the demographic of your your listenership is faith wise, um, but yeah, I'm I'm a very evangelical Protestant, and so uh, the town that we're in is very traditional Catholic and Lutheran, and so anything that isn't that is kind of looked askance at. So that's actually to me one of the exciting things about starting the coffee shop is before that. You know, I was just like the guy who pastored that church that meets in the VFW hall, which is kind of weird. Like you can't have church and like (laughs) under underneath the Budweiser sign. Uh, And and I mean, I think people still probably think that's a little bit weird. But but now being involved, more invested in the community, not not driving over to the next town to work 55 hours a week. You know, we're, we're here and very publicly committed to just investing in the good of the community, not just ultimately, like, I think the most important part of my life is yes, proselytizing and, and trying to reach people for Christ. But for someone not coming from that perspective, they can see that we're interested in just doing good in the town too, uh, in creating some job opportunities for some kids and uh, providing a, a service. There's, there wasn't any espresso within 15, 20 minutes of here. And, People love their espresso and their Lotus drinks. I don't, I don't know if they have those out there, but anyway, so the, our process has been, we started a Bible study with a lot of church people and then started a Sunday morning service. Uh, and now we're kind of moving into more of an evangelism phase. And I think that's inverse really of probably how I would recommend doing it. I would probably start more evangelistic and then formalize your structure as you go. But it's, it's the path the Lord brought us down. And so I feel like we've learned a lot. I've grown a lot through it. Uh, So that's where we're at. What, what's something you feel that you've, uh, you've done right? Oh, well, this has been one of the hard things, but I've taken some pretty hard stands just on, as far as our church culture, as far as um, things that we're going to prioritize and not prioritize, you know, these last few years have been so, so political and, And I have people in my church who think I don't care about politics because I'm so militantly opposed to making church about politics. Uh, No, that's like a totally wrong read on me. I have more political opinions than probably any person should, but I I used to be absolutely obsessed with it. And I still probably obsess more, (laughs) more than I ought to, but 
but the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is not tied to a donkey or an elephant, you know, and, yeah. you know, if people trust in princes, but we trust in the name of the Lord, our God is, is what the psalmist says. And, and we can't get that myopic. And, and there are people who they think being tied to the Lord Jesus Christ means being tied to a certain political agenda. And when you dig your heels in on that and say, uh, no, that's not right they'll get offended and they'll leave, which has been really hard. I mean, I don't, I don't, uh, maybe I sound a little snooty saying that I, I don't mean to, uh, right. because that that's really put a lot of strain on relationships that are important to me, but I, I just don't think we can, I don't think we can let politics dictate, uh, the stances we take with our faith. Um, so that, that's one hard thing that I feel like we've, it's been the right thing to do, but it has cost us. Absolutely. That is awesome. Yeah. So I, I also wanted to, to talk about your podcast. Uh, so kind of give uh, the listeners an idea of the, what the stopping to think podcast is all about. So my wife's been bugging me to start a podcast for, I don't know how long. I mean, I, I love podcasts. I, like I said, I worked for the post office for 13 years and the last eight years of that, was as a city carrier. So I spent a lot of time walking, uh, with nothing like it wasn't mentally demanding work. It was physically hard, but it was not mentally strenuous. So I listened to a lot of audiobooks and a lot of podcasts and I've been, I started blogging while I was still in high school. So I started the stopping to think blog in I think 2007 or eight. And I've kind of written on and off on there. And I started up a, uh, newsletter back in, I want to say January, I think I sent my first one out. And uh, I want to say probably two months after that, I thought, "Ah, maybe I could turn this into a podcast. And so I did that. I I picked up some cheap gear. I probably need to invest in some better stuff if I'm going to keep doing it, but picked up some cheap gear and started just reading. Initially, that, that was where I started was just reading some things that I'd already written. And then I started to branch into some interviews uh, and I mean, using a service like Podmatch to kind of meet meet folks like you that I wouldn't have had any any interaction with outside of that. I wouldn't have known who you were. Um, and and as I start to get comfortable with that, uh, my intention is to start reaching out to some some kind of people that I do know who they are. And I'm like, man, I'd really love to have a conversation with that guy. Uh, and, and hopefully I'll have developed some interviewing skills by then. <laughs> but I, I guess the, the heart behind it is I, I, ever since I was a kid, I, I was, was always accused of thinking too much. Uh, and I don't believe that's possible. I do think we, people can have paralysis by analysis and think instead of act. Uh, but, but I think generally in our society, if you take, Twitter or the news or uh, conversations with the average person on the street as any indication is that probably we could do a little bit more stopping to think before we speak, think before we act, think before we start going with our thumbs. Um, and, and so I just, I want to talk to interesting people, you know, folks like you, I had a historian, Jim Ambusky, and we talked about, uh, just the disappointment that Thomas Jefferson had with George the third as a father and how that like that, how, how the thinking that Americans had at the time of the revolution about the King, how that relates to how we think about the president today. So things obscure might seem as obscure as that, but I think actually have a lot of value for us today. And then uh, I've had a couple of great conversations with some pastors and as my interests are fairly broad, I like history. I like theology. I like the outdoors. I, I like reading and writing. Uh, yeah. Anyway, I, it doesn't have like a theme other than I'm interested in it. So, right. That's awesome. Yeah. I, and your, uh, your interview with, uh, with Pete Rogers was fantastic. Um, uh, listeners will recognize his name. He was, uh, he was on here. Um, we talked about, you know, overcoming his, his stutter and, um, becoming a professional speaker. So, um, yeah, that was, uh, I, I, I really enjoyed that one too. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm really enjoying your podcast and I'm, I'm like you, I love podcast. I, I am a po- podcast junkie. 
Um, mm-hmm. you know, I've, I've subscribed to many more podcasts than I'm like physically capable of keeping <laughs> up with, but I, uh, yeah, I, I am definitely all about some podcasts. Um, but you, uh, you mentioned your, your love for the outdoors. Um, so let's, let's talk a, a little bit about, um, about kind of your fishing background, um, and, uh, and your, your outdoors background. So what was it, um, when, when did you get started on fishing and who, who was it and what was it that got you, got you into it? Oh man, I, I, I don't have a memory of a time before I started fishing. Uh, I mean, part of that is probably that I don't have very many memories from super early childhood, uh, probably seven years of football did something to do with that. But, uh, my dad would take us fishing when we were kids. Uh, but you know, I, I remember doing a lot of the lake I grew up up close to. So I grew up in North Idaho, about five minutes from Lake Coeur d'Alene, uh, which these days is kind of a big bass fishery and Northern Pike. But in those days there, I don't know that there even were bass in the lake yet. And there definitely weren't as many pike. Uh, it was, it was a big perch fishery. Uh, and so I just remember going down to the docks and filling buckets with perch. That's probably my first fishing memory. Uh, is, is just sitting there with a, a bobber and a worm and, and reeling in perch after perch after perch. Um, the, uh, the person who probably influenced me the most as far as fishing was my mom's stepdad, my, my grandpa. Um, I mean, he, he's my mom's stepdad, but he's really the only grandpa I ever had any interaction with. And he was, he had worked for the Idaho department of fishing game for three decades and had been an outfitter and a guide. And so he was just, he ate, slept and breathed the outdoors. I mean, until he died at 88, I think. And until two years before he died, he still had a job that kept him outdoors, uh, work, worked as a, a woods, a woods cop, basically a security for a timber company on the weekends. And so I grew up hanging out with him and, uh, he, he was a big, he, I didn't really enjoy the same kind of fishing he did. He was really into boat fishing, uh, trolling, so he loved to troll for kokanee and rainbow. So I remember just sitting on the boat with him or for a while uh, when I was a really little kid, he, he was a boat deputy for the County. And so he'd go out in the summer and roll around on the boat and check people's licenses and make sure they weren't drinking and operating a boat and things like that. And sometimes he would take us out on the, the boat and drop us off on a dock that was just floating out in the middle of the lake so we could fish for crappie out there. And awesome. I, I think I remember you uh, tra- or saying, saying crappy. Do you guys say crappy down there? Yeah. So um, I, I think it's more of an, of an East to West thing than it is a North to South thing, but okay. Yeah, um, it's, I mean, that's how it's spelled. It is. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I've always, always said crappy and, uh, I always get on, on, on anybody that's near me that says crappie piece just because uh, yeah. it's, it's fun too, but <laughs> we're, we're, we're hardcore crappie people where I'm from. And that's how I've heard people say in the Midwest too. So I don't know. Anyway, so maybe maybe the uh, Mississippi somewhere over there is a, a dividing line maybe. between <laughs> pronunciations. I don't know. So anyway, yeah, I grew up doing that. And then as I got older and started fishing uh, more on my own or with my buddies, you know, we'd, we'd go down to the lake and we'd fish for pike or, or for bass. And then I just I absolutely love river fishing. Uh, so I grew up a Lake Coeur d'Alene on the, the southeast corner of it runs in the, the St. Joe River runs in, which is. Uh, kind of a premier cutthroat fishery. Now at, at that time, it was still mostly rainbows, but then there's still some West Slope cut, cutthroat in there and fishing games done a lot to, to promote getting rid of rainbows and building up the cutthroat population. Uh, but that that's my favorite type of fishing is, is trout in moving water. Uh, that's awesome. P- part of that's cause I'm really impatient. Uh, <laughs> so I just like moving with my hands and I like what I like, I like watching a MEP spinner spin through with cl- crystal clear river. Like that's just, I just like it. Even if I'm not catching fish, I like the activity. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I'm not super familiar with the geography of Idaho. Um, but what, uh, are, how close were you? I think it, is it the snake river that's, that's there in Idaho? Yeah. So or, I grew up about a hundred miles North of Lewiston, which is where the snake, um, okay. kind of, kind of meets, it go it, it crosses from Idaho into Washington. Okay. I mean, so it, it 
it runs along the border of Idaho and Oregon for quite a ways through Hell's Canyon. And then at, at Lewiston, it turns west and uh, becomes the border of Washington and Oregon. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's one that, that I've always wanted to fish to, to go after some of the, the really big, uh, really big sturgeon that are, that are there. So that would be, that would be a really awesome trip. And I was just curious if you had, if you had done that one. But. I've never done sturgeon. I've got buddies that have, and man, those fish are huge. I mean, it's, it's like you're pulling a dinosaur out of the water. Uh, no, I've never done that. It, it does look like super fun though. Yeah, for sure. So there was one thing that you um, you asked me to make sure to to bring up so that we could talk about, and I have no clue what I'm getting myself into here. But I wanted to ask about, um, let's see, what was it? Saint Saint Joe Bank Bait Company. Saint Joe Bait Company, yeah. So the same grandpa that was a, a officer for Idaho Department of Fish and Game, and then actually after he retired from that, he became a an enforcement agent for. Idaho Outfitters and Guides Association. So what he would do, or for the Outfitters and Guides Licensing Board, and so he would go on undercover trips. He got paid to go hunting and fishing with guys to check whether they were actually licensed guides. I mean, what a sweet gig. Yeah, uh, for sure. And, but, or I think it would have been maybe slightly before he retired from fishing game, he had the idea, and and this is, this is classic, like textbook, my grandparents relationship. He had this idea of, we need to start a bait company, which then for, let's see here, mid eighties to 10, 20, yeah, 30 years, my grandmother wound up running, but this bait company was a maggot company. Like we didn't sell worms. We didn't sell wax worms. We didn't sell lures. We sold maggots. That's it. And in the early days, so probably the first, I don't know, five, 10 years, uh, thankfully before I got into it and was really heavily involved, <laughs> they grew the maggots themselves. And so as, as a fish and game officer, anytime that somebody would have roadkill, he'd get called up and he had a winch on the back of his rig. And they built this cinder block building out in their field where they would throw this roadkill or if somebody had a horse die, they'd take the, the horse in and throw it in this cinder block building wait for the maggots to come blow the carcass and then go scoop up the maggots and and like i said this was mostly my grandmother she has like the strongest stomach of anybody i ever know but i mean then they package them up and sell them as fishing bait uh oh and you know you don't you don't hear a whole lot about maggots as bait but it's it's huge at least in our area, it was huge in the wintertime for ice fishermen. Uh, they, they hold up on, they hold up on a line really well or on a hook really well in the winter through the ice. Uh, some guys swear they, what they'll do sometimes when you're growing maggots is you'll dye the meat that the maggots are growing on. And so you'll end up with, you could do, yeah, they do all kinds of colors, but we'd, we'd always buy pink maggots. Thankfully, by the time, by the time I was helping out with this. So this is actually, it wound up being how I wound up getting my post office job was my grandparents would go South for two months every winter. And so I would house sit for them and take care of all their farm animals. And I would take care of the bait business. So I got to hang out with maggots for a couple months every year and keep all the fishermen happy. Uh, they, they use them for, for fishing through the ice and then also mountain whitefish, it's, it's a big bait. And then occasionally you'd have somebody who moved over from England and in England, they're huge for trout. Like they swear by maggots for trout over there. Yeah. And, and so that in the States, I feel like worms are definitely more popular. If you're going to, if you're going to drown some bait for trout, it worms are the way to go, but some people swear by maggots. Yeah, I was going to say that um, I, I listened to a podcast, uh, a carp fishing podcast over in, in the UK, and they, uh, they they talk a lot about maggots. And um, and I, personally, I've never used maggots. I've used a lot of things for bait, but I don't know that I've ever used maggots. Um, so I, I'm trying to, to picture it because to me, maggots are super tiny little little worms. So are you like using a really, really tiny hook and hooking one worm onto a hook or. Yeah. Well, I mean, a lot of ice fishing, if you're you, a lot of times you're fishing for panfish, And so you are using really tiny gear. And so, I mean, you put one or two spikes on there and some people call them spikes and 
that's that's plenty and they'll hold up for i mean you'll catch three four fish on the same maggot uh you you can use them on bigger hooks but yeah smaller smaller gear is better my friends always made fun of me in high school so like when i was doing a lot of fishing in high school like my friends are always out there fishing for bass fishing for like man i gotta catch a big fish my brother's a huge i gotta catch a big fish i was like and I get bored waiting for a big fish. So I just want to catch whatever's going to bite. And I see bluegill right here off the dock. And I see that school of crappie swimming through the lake. I'm going to fish for those guys. So I had a little tiny gear, my little tiny spinning reel with four pound test. And a lot of times I caught fish and they didn't. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, yeah, I, anytime that I want to, you know, have one of those times where it's like, you catch 30 fish in 30 minutes, but none of them are bigger than six inches. Yeah. I, I have just as much fun with that as I do going out bass fishing sometimes for sure. Now, that's uh, definitely where I'm at with kids at this point. Like <laughs> the times that I can get out, a, I'm probably not actually going to wet a line myself. It's all going to be them. So right. Occasionally my wife will chase me out of the house and be like, you just have to go fishing and do not take anybody with you because you need to go. But you know, <laughs> if I'm taking the kids out, like we're, we're going for easy wins. So. Absolutely. Yeah. So there are, there are a couple questions that I always ask all of my guests and um, want to make sure that, that you get a chance to answer them as well. Um, so the first is my favorite of the whole podcast. And I, uh, I want to ask what fishing story or memory means the most to you? Hmm. That's a good question. Which one means the most to me? There, there's a couple that jump to mind. Uh, I might run through a couple if that's cool with you. Yeah. I mean, the, the first one that, the first one that jumped to my mind was, uh, I'm sitting on the bank of Marble Creek, uh, which is a tributary to, the St. Joe river. And actually at this point, I think what I'm about to describe would be legal, but I don't think it was then. Uh, and I was floating a, a worm under a bobber, just watching it. like cast upstream, watch it float downstream and it hit this pool and boom, that bobber goes down. And to me, it was just like the most exciting thing in the world. Uh, you know, it was maybe an eight inch rainbow on the other end, but to me, it was just like, Hey, we'd been, we're camping there on the shore with my dad and a couple of my brothers and yeah, it was, it was just like that whole experience wrapped up in that, that one moment, uh, right before I got married, maybe two weeks before I got married, my brother and another guy and I went on a hike through the Bob Marshall wilderness. So we went, it was a point to point hike. We started on the, the West side. Uh, I think that's the bitter root river over there. And we hiked up over the great divide down onto, I don't even remember what the river is on the other side. Uh, but it was about a 42 mile hike that we did in, in four days. And I, I bought a two day fishing license in Montana. And so all the way up, I, I was fishing for, for rainbows. I think it was there and, you know, just catch and cook it up in your rice at night. And that, that was, uh, I, was, I, there's nothing better to me. Like it's definitely not the premier table fish, but there's nothing better to me than fresh trout from the river. Like, cooking it right there where you caught it. Like to me, that's the best thing in the world. Um, the other memories would just be like, man, times in high school where buddies and I would go out and spend all night on the bank fishing for bullhead and generally not catching anything. Like we we're awful bullhead fishermen. <laughs> How do you not catch bullhead? Uh, but we managed to do it and kill case after case of pop. Uh, while we did it and smoked too many cigars and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and for those of us who are, who are Southern listeners, uh, pop means soda. Um, <laughs> <laughs> correct. Ruby red squirt to be exact. I, I'm, uh, I'm sorry. What Ruby red squirt. So what is, what is Ruby red squirt? Yeah. Have you had squirt? Never heard of it. Oh, really? Oh, who makes it? I want to say maybe it's a Dr. Pepper product. I don't know. Um, it's, I mean, hypothetically, Ruby Red is like, ostensibly, it's supposed to be like Ruby Red grapefruit. What it okay. is, is really sweet red soda, to, to use your familiar terminology, that actually, A, it has a super high sugar content, even for pop. B, it all has more caffeine than Mountain Dew, which wow. when I found that out, it was like the best thing in my life because yeah. I went for a long period of my life where I ran on caffeine and not sleep. 
So, yeah, uh, I used to call it the sweet nectar of life. I can't drink pop anymore. It makes my joints hurt and I feel like crap for two days after I drink one pop. But right. I, there was a time when I'd used to go through a lot of it. Yeah, I'm starting to get to that point myself. Um, and I am in the process of trying to to kick it out of my life. And I am uh I'm, I'm bad at bringing it back every now and then. And once I bring it back once it stays with me for a really long time and it's really hard to mm. kick it out again. So, um, but the one we have here that would, it, it's not, it's not near as caffeinated as, as squirt sounds like it is, but um, we have cheer wine and that is our, our red, uh, our red soda. It's like a, like a cherry, cherry flavored soda. That's, um, ah. And that's, that's one that's really hard for me to give up. So. <laughs> I've never heard of that. Um, so, yeah, it's interesting to know that there are still regional things in, in, the, in the United States that we've never heard of. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and, and something as, as popular as soda. So, yeah. So um, whenever you are typically out fishing with somebody, uh, what is your, what's your conversation centered around? What are you typically talking about? Uh, boy, right now, mostly if I'm fishing, it's with my kids and it's try not to tangle your line next time. Here's how to <laughs> cast. Uh, no, you can't stand that close to your brother. Uh, things like that. But, you know, for several years, uh, most of my fishing that, that I was doing was just with, uh, kids that I knew through through the teen center uh, when when we were living over uh, in a little bit bigger town west of us, and and this teen center was run by Youth for Christ, and so you're just trying to build relationships with kids. A lot of them came from either broken homes or just not super great family situations, and so you're trying to build relationships with them to share Christ, but also just so that they had somebody older in their life that they knew cared about them that they could talk to. Uh, so uh, sometimes I take those kids fishing, and you know just just ask them about life and, uh, how, how things were going. And if there was anything that I could be praying for them about, uh, what they thought they were going to do when they grew up and just kind of give some life advice, uh, as much good life advice as somebody who at that point was in their mid twenties could give, but, uh, maybe more than what they had. And Absolutely. so, yeah, growing up, I mean, you know, when you're hanging out with your buddies, you talk about everything while you're fishing, absolutely everything. And I kind of look forward to my kids being a little bit older to where they're competent with with a, a rod and reel. And then we're not having to walk through that process constantly. And I, I feel like those conversations will open up with them. Uh, really, the only other fishing I do with with other people at this point is like if I'm going back home and I say, Hey, will you meet me down at the lake? I you know, somebody you haven't seen for a few years and just like, you ch- you catch up on life. Um, Absolutely. That is awesome. Well, um, we have a segment that we, um, we go through with all of our guests. It's called what's your favorite. It's self-explanatory. I'm just going to ask you your favorite in a few different categories. And we are going to jump into that right after this. With 30 years of experience of handcrafting lures under his belt, Mr. B of Mr. B Lure Company is making high quality spinner baits, buzz baits, jigs, underspins, swim blades, and more right here in the U.S. All of his skirts are hand tied and all of his baits feature a baked on powder paint, all metal components, and only owner and gamagatsu hooks. All of his baits come in a variety of colors, and if you purchase a bait in the Battle Shad color, 30% of the proceeds go to the Wounded Warrior Project. To see the quality for yourself, go to MrBLureCompany.com, that's MRBLureCompany.com, to place your order and use promo code FAITH, the letter N, FISH, the letter N, P-O-D, 1X10 at checkout to save 10% on your first order. All right, so to get us started off, what is your favorite scripture? Favorite scripture. You know, a pastor really ought to have like a quick answer to that. Uh, I mean, probably probably the most substantial would be something like Romans 8, 1. There's therefore no, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, you know, to, to be in Christ. Uh, probably that or... or John 1 12 uh, to those who believed in his name to those who received him who believed in his name he gave the right to become children of God and just uh, 
the idea of adoption, uh, that the, the doctrine of adoption is really important to me, that, that God adopts us as his children when we trust in Christ, uh, that, that that's one that I've sat with a long time. Probably the one, honestly, that I think about the most uh, is Ecclesiastes 7, uh, where, where it says, better to go to the house of mourning than to go to how, the house of feasting for such is the end of all mankind and the living will lay it to heart. The heart of the wise is in the heart of, is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. And and just that idea that the death is something we really ought to stop and think about, and and ponder and, and and consider the reality of our mortality, and and where do we stand with God in light of that? In fact, the first verse of Ecclesiastes seven says that uh, I'm not going to get it quoted word perfect off the top of my head. Uh, but it's that that the best the best perfume. Let me pull it up here so I I get it exactly right. Uh, For sure, yeah. I I found that uh, a lot of pastors it's 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 not that they don't have one. It's that they have trouble narrowing it down to one. <laughs> that's true, and that but that sounds really like pious to say. <laughs> <laughs> Ecclesiastes seven one it says a good name is better than precious ointment and the day of death than the day of birth. And, and that's so countercultural. Uh, you know, we, we live in a day where, where we send old people to nursing homes and we very often, I, I think I just read an article in Christianity today that it's like 38% of people don't even have a service now. Uh, and I just think that's absolutely tragic, not only because then that per- there's, there's not an opportunity to celebrate that person's life and, and to remember them, but, then everybody that's left behind a isn't having the opportunity for closure and, and to mourn properly, but also that's just a really important time to think about your own life. And it's, yeah. So, so Ecclesiastes seven is a, a passage that I come back to a lot. I, I don't know that I've ever done a funeral where I didn't touch on it. Absolutely. What about a particular story from the Bible? Is there one of those that's your favorite? Again, I don't know if I have a favorite. I really, I really enjoy John chapter nine, where Jesus uh, heals a man who'd been lame for thirty-eight years, and you you get into that story, and f- when he's when he's healed, the the Pharisees flip out at him because he's carrying his mat on the Sabbath, and and then they go to his parents and say, is this really your son? Is this really the guy who was lame? And they're like, yeah, it's him. But well, how did he get healed? Well, we, we don't know. They know, but they're afraid to say anything because it would cost them socially. And so they're afraid, they're afraid to, to talk about it. And so they go to him and he's like, yeah, yeah, Jesus healed. Well, he actually, he doesn't know who it is specifically yet. He just knows that somebody healed him. And he knows that that man probably should be trusted because God used him to heal him. And, mm-hmm. and then, <laughs> then he he asks him, "Why do you want to become his disciples too?" And uh, I just I just love the snark in that answer. Um, so I, I love John chapter nine. I've also uh, really been thinking a lot about Second Samuel twenty four. Uh, I preached on it a couple times lately at a at a church camp and then another church I was visiting. Uh, but in that story, David it's it's kind of the conclusion, uh, obviously, of the first and second Samuel narratives. But King David, who we often think of as like this great example from the Old Testament, I'm preaching through his life right now. And he's really he's a train wreck, to be honest. But the thing that he does that is admirable, that it's different than Saul. Actually, his sins are worse than Saul's who came before him and who God rejected and 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 cut his family off. But but David, even though his sins are worse, he turns to God in repentance from his sins. Instead of making excuses, he says, no, Lord. But then in 2 Samuel 24, he sins and he recognizes it and he goes to the Lord and, and repents. And, and I think in that moment, God does forgive him. I mean, God is glad to forgive our sins when we, we, when we ask. But he still faces the consequences of his sin, which again, like that cuts against the grain of we, we think that if God forgives us, then that means no consequences. But what that actually means is if God forgives us, he removes the condemnation, the eternal condemnation that comes from our sin, because that's all gone to Christ. But in this life, there still really are consequences. Uh, and I think that, I mean, as a dad, that's a huge lesson that I'm trying to impart to my kids. Like your actions really do matter. 
God, it's not going to change how much God loves you. It's not going to change that he's there for you, that he's happy to forgive you, that you're secure eternally in Christ if you trust in him. But your actions still do matter. Uh, Galatians 6 says that whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. God is not mocked. Um, and so, yeah, those are those are two stories that, that I really have been thinking a lot about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. So what is your favorite fish to catch? Oh, it's trout and rainbows just because I've caught the more of them than, than others. I, I've never really lived in an area with brown trout. So I, I'd kind of like at some point, like this is my, my bucket list. I haven't actually told my brothers this. I don't think maybe I have, I've got, well, I have eight brothers, but I've got two that I'm pretty close to uh, in age and just like relationally. Uh, and when our boys are a little older, I'd love to do like a, a trout trip where we just like start in Colorado and maybe work our way back up. To, to North Idaho, where we're from. Uh, I think that would be a blast. Take our boys and do that and try to catch browns and rainbows and cutthroat and brookies. And yeah. That's awesome. So in your, your part of the country are rainbows uh, technically native or are they naturalized and, um, but, uh, or uh, introduced stock uh, that kind of thing. so so north idaho where i'm from they are native like they are they're native to the west slope of the rockies but out here like anything that's here is planted yeah any any cold <laughs> cold running water fish clear anything that needs clear water isn't native to northwest iowa uh, <laughs> okay yeah so in in our mountains we have um we have rainbow trout that are stocked and um, they are they are not a native species to North Carolina. The the only native species we have is the brook trout. But um, but yeah, I was just curious because I'm trout are one of those that I I don't know a whole lot about. Whereas most other fish I've studied more than anyone, um, more than any other thing I've ever studied, and mm. I wasn't getting graded on it. So um, <laughs> yeah, um, you know yeah. what's interesting with trout. And this is just something I've observed. I, I'm I'm not a great fisherman for anything, but I feel like trout have produced some of the best fishing literature. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely they have. And I think part of that is because a lot of people just fly fish for them. And, and to me, this is totally like just conjecture, but it seems like the kind of person that would be happy just like going back and forth and back and forth with a rod is the kind of person that's sitting there thinking and tends to be like just the more literary type. I, I don't know if there's anything to that or not, but like, I mean, you, current guys like Tom McGuane, uh, big fly fisherman. Uh, yeah. And I've got old, old books on my shelf and, any of them, of course, you go back far enough and that's what fishing was. You either used a net or you were a fly fisherman, but. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, as um, my listeners know, I work at a bookstore and um, the fishing section that we have is is one that's kind of like, it's, it's near about every book has one of my staff picks in it. And um, yeah, the, uh, the fly fishing uh, is what most of those books are about. Um, you know, you got guys like John Garrett and Lefty Cray, mm -hmm. and, um, guys that are, you know, absolute legends in, in the sport. And then guys that are kind of upcoming, um, uh, they, I think it's Dave Coggins just, uh, came out with one somewhat recently called the optimist. That is absolutely fantastic. Um, Thomas McWayne's, um, uh, fishing books are, are um they're definitely not my favorite they're a little bit um what's the word i don't want to say pretentious but oh pretentious is a fair word for tom <laughs> Gwynn. like um, i but, i just finished a life in fishing oh no the longest silence that yeah. a life in fishing yeah. is the subtitle yeah. and i mean there are some fantastic essays in that book and there they're are some where i'm like dude you are so pretentious. And part of it, part of that I enjoy. Like, okay, so being someone fishing, fly fishing for tarp and like, that's kind of a pretentious activity. And it's enjoyable to read about. Like he's a, he's, he's a good writer. And some of the things, uh, some of the essays I just didn't enjoy because I didn't enjoy the subject matter. I thought he was at his best when he was in foreign countries and observing people. 
Yeah. I, I think he writes better about people than about fishing. But uh, least, anyway, I yeah. agree. And I, I will say uh, for the longest silence, I kept my thesaurus close by. Um, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of words. <laughs> Um, yeah, for sure. So, uh, let's see. So trout specifically rainbow was your favorite fish to catch. What is your favorite fish to fish for? No, oh, that'd be the same. Yeah, for sure. The the- Absolutely. And this, this may be, uh, one of the only, I think I, we've had one other that has been all three across the board, but what is your favorite fish to eat? Oh, to eat, you know, I really like to eat pike. Uh, pike are good. My grandma would always do, she called it poor man's lobster, where she'd just soak it in sugar water overnight or whatever, and then you'd fry it. Uh, I've also just taken like Jiffy cornmeal mix and then deep fried it. That's good. I, I've never had pike away that I didn't like it. Uh, depending on how you pickle it, I'm not crazy about I love pickled food, but sometimes when people pickle pike, they do it a little too sweet for me. Like mm-hmm. I think if it was a little more dilly or sour or something, it'd be better. Um, but I, I love to eat pike. Okay. Yeah. I've had, I've had pickled herring, but I haven't had any other pickled fish. So, um, but yeah. So, um, speaking of, speaking of food, what is your favorite fishing snack? Oh, well, I don't know. I'm a pretty, uh, promiscuous eater. I'll eat just about anything that's put in front of me. Fishing snack, I don't know. It's hard to be when you're outside. It's tough to be just like some good, really tough jerky that you have to work on for a really long time. Uh, back before I quit using tobacco at all, my favorite snack was just to have a, a cigar with me or a, some loose tobacco. I don't, you know, and, uh, but yeah, probably jerky would be probably where it's at. Absolutely. Is, um, your go-to beef or is there another another meat that is your beef beef's usually what i end up eating i mean if i've killed a deer recently then uh, venison jerky is always good uh but it's been a while since i had venison in the freezer so i hear you all right uh so what is um what is your favorite favorite lure to throw a uh, map spinner I don't care what size. I mean, depends. The size depends on what I'm fishing for, but right. just the plain old Mepsigila. Uh, yeah, I grew up on the Panther Martin myself. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm pretty sure at one point my dad handed me um, a Panther Martin. Said, "If you can't catch a fish on this, I'm taking your rod away from you." <laughs> That's probably a fair thing to say. <laughs> yeah, I always made fun of my brother for using Panther Martins, but he still always pulled in fish. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I love an inline spinner. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm I'm there with you on that one. Uh, I feel well, like I catch more fish on it just because I'm more confident in it. Like a, it's a lure that I'm more likely to leave in the water. And so I spend less time holding my pole, tying on a new lure if I just right. put that on to start with. And so it's in the water working and catching fish rather than moving from my hand to the line to the tackle box and back and forth, which is if I'm using other things, I'm not very patient with it. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I don't want to ask for GPS coordinates or secret spots or anything, but what's your favorite body of water to fish? Uh, the St. Joe river, uh, which I, if any of my brothers are like, probably shut up, don't tell people to come to Idaho. But I remember seeing Sandra Day O'Connor on that river. So it's not exactly a, trade secret that that's a good place to go fishing um yeah it i just and i love being up there to me that's just like it's not home but it's close to home and right i just i just love being in in those mountains and it's as romantic to me as anything so absolutely and uh your favorite um favorite time of year to fish Mm, probably fall Not because I've had more success in the fall, but just because that's my favorite time to be outside. Uh, I I love being outside in the fall is that that smell this morning. It was kind of cool. And I thought it almost smells like fall. We're getting close. (laughs) Uh, So that's, that's by far and away. I mean, growing up playing football fall, like that's that smell in the air and being out, you know, hunting bear, hunting deer, hunting elk, like you're, you're out there in the fall. I, I like being out in the spring too. 
summer I am not the biggest fan of. I hate the heat. And so why I moved to the Midwest where it's hot and humid. Uh, sometimes God calls us to places that wouldn't be our first choice. Uh, but I, I, I love it. I, I really do love it here. I, I shouldn't say that. But um, yeah, I, I like the fall. Absolutely. So um, there in in Iowa, when does fall start? Uh, depends on the year. Uh, we had one year a couple years ago. Uh, maybe it, it, now I think about it, it's 20, it was 2016, so it's been a while back, but we had 70 degrees clear into November, which was just insane. Um, I'd say pretty consistently, you're going to be getting cool nights by the end of September into October. Uh, that that you can usually count on. It's Even if it's still pretty warm during the day, it's going to at least start cooling off at night, which is, to me, yeah. that's the hardest thing about summer is you're not getting cool nights. Right. So. Yeah, for sure. It has it been a brutal summer there this year? Yeah, off and on. Uh, we did have a week where it was really nice. It was like eighty degrees and fifty at night, and that was fantastic. But it's it's been pretty warm. Uh, yesterday was like a hundred and two or something. Uh, yeah, we, I know we, in some parts of the country isn't crazy, but for here we had we've had a lot of hundred degree days this year. It's felt like Florida here for the past uh, I was a little over a month. Like it's thunderstorms every day, humid, triple digit yeah. weather. It's it's been miserable, and I am ready yeah. for fall um, for sure. Um, but yeah, so um, we are going to start wrapping things up, man. Uh, so if you would uh, let us know what you have, uh, what is upcoming for Will Dole for. Um, for uh rents and ministries and uh for um for the stopping the think podcast oh just ministry wise we're moving into to fall and so we'll start hopefully some stuff for kids we actually still haven't done our vacation bible school that's coming up so you know just the normal church stuff hoping to get some men's ministry going this fall that's one thing that uh so i just i just left the post office less than a year ago so we still kind of are in the transition process of like having more time to invest in people. And so uh, figuring out what that's going to look like, I'm hoping to get a men's group going, which I think will be really good um, on the stop and to think podcast. I've got a couple of good interviews coming up. Uh, uh, Yanni Grasinopoulos, who's a, a leadership coach is coming up on the podcast. Uh, a couple of different guys, a couple of different pastors, uh, Douglas Brower, a guy who's served several places in the States and overseas and has written a memoir on that. And Mike Moffat, who's a guy out in the Northwest, um, hosts the Bible Jazz podcast. He's coming up on the podcast. That that was a good good conversation. Uh, and I'm, yeah, just looking to expand that a little bit and uh, have some more interesting conversations with people of various backgrounds. And so I'm looking forward to that. I also have a, a newsletter that I work on. Uh, I'm always poking away at different writing projects. So absolutely. And are are you still? Uh, is the blog still? So the thing that's going or has that kind of all moved over to the podcast platform? Uh, so I don't do a ton on the, the main thing that ends up on the blog itself is book reviews. So I, I mean, I utilize a Goodreads account and then I cross post those on my blog, wildol.com. And, and that actually the blog itself is the easiest place to find everything else that I'm doing. It's got links to sermons from the church and to my newsletter, uh, which is through get review, which is part of the Twitter platform. And so at the easiest place to get to that is from willdole.com. Awesome. Um, and, uh, I, I want to give you an open floor for, um, shout outs for supporters or anybody you want to say thank you to anyone, anyone you want to give a shout out to all that good stuff. Oh boy. I should have thought about this a little bit harder. Uh, it, it's now a closed business, but I will mention again the St. Joe Bank Company because that was so formative for me. Anybody who uh, fished using maggots in in a lot of the Northwest for a long time would have been using St. Joe Bank maggots. I mean, Sportsman's Warehouse was probably our biggest buyer in Missoula and Spokane and Coeur d'Alene and uh, Boise even for a while. So, like, yeah, I, I'm, I actually miss a lot of that sound weird to say I miss working with fly larva, uh, but it was just, it was really relaxing and 
you knew lots of people. Uh, you just knew where it was going, and you're like, man, a lot of people are having a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. So it was, uh, so it was pretty sweet, and that was it was a really formative experience for me because I started taking care of that business for months at a time when I was in my teen years, and I just uh, it developed a lot of maturity in me having to take seriously running a business. Um, and so, shout out to my grandparents for throwing that responsibility on me. <laughs> um, Absolutely. I, I, I wish I knew off the top of my head all the supporters. So through that get review platform that that I send out my newsletter through, you can sign up for the newsletter. It's absolutely free, uh, but there's also the opportunity where you can be a patron and support it. And so there are several people that that support the writing monthly, uh, and I really uh, appreciate that. I mean, it kind of gives me more incentive to write and uh, to keep disciplined at it. I kind of let my writing fall off for a while, and. Um, and I would be tempted to do that again, especially now that I'm, I'm podcasting, but or, it's interesting. So, I mean, you, you've done some to speaking and some preaching, I'm sure you through years in youth ministry and it's a very, I, I've always been a writer. Uh, so I, I started writing, I actually started my first newsletter when I was a little kid, like 11 years old, I started a newsletter for teenagers. I'm sure they were very interested to read what a, an 11 year old had to say, but but that's just always been something I've been interested in. I love the written word. I love the the page and or the screen as it is now. And and just language is fascinating to me. And so, I, like I said, it, when you're preaching, you're using words, but it's very different. Uh, communicating orally is very different than communicating through writing. And right. and so it's it's something that I'd kind of let slip in a lot of ways. And I'm I'm happy to be disciplined to be putting that out. I put it out every two weeks. Uh, every every other Wednesday, the Stop and I Think newsletter goes out. So awesome! And uh, if you want, to... I should I should I'm sorry to interrupt you. I should shout out my wife right here. Andy <laughs> is the best. Uh, she's put up with me now for almost eleven years of marriage, and um, I couldn't ask for anything better. That's awesome. And I, I want to uh, give you an op- opportunity if you if you want to to throw out you know social media that kind of thing if. Uh, for you or for the church or for the podcast, if, if uh, listeners want to, to follow you and, and keep up with your adventures, how do they find you? Yeah. Um, personally, I'm not on social. Uh, I got off of social media. That's a whole nother story unto itself, but right. It is a transition during the 2016 election, right at the beginning of 2016 itself, which was a huge, like a lot of people were actually upset with my wife and I, because we had made it a practice to live tweet debates and uh yeah anyway we were we were at a point in life where we just decided it wasn't good for our uh parenting specifically at that point uh but then our our marriage and our mental health i think probably were also involved as far as being involved this was before it was like the cool thing to do like i'm gonna go off social media for my mental health or for my interaction with the real right. world but we were we were ahead of the curve on that one and <laughs> Uh, we're now, uh, I mean, the church is on, is on Facebook, Remsen Bible Fellowship. We're also on YouTube. Um, the podcast is on, I think all the major pod, podcast platforms. I mean, Apple podcast, uh, Google podcast, stopping to think if you Google us, it, it should pop right up for you. And you might have to filter through a couple with similar names, but stopping to think is the only stopping to think podcast. Um, and, uh, so personally, really, the only place to find out what I'm doing is at willdole.com, which is pretty straightforward. That's why I bought that domain was once I got off social media, nobody knew how to find my blog anymore. So I right. bought bought my name domain. Awesome. Well, Will, man, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, this has been a fantastic conversation and uh, I wish you all the best, man. Uh, thanks, Cam. I really appreciate the opportunity. Get Outdoors Pedal and Paddle in Greenboro, North Carolina offers a wide range of products and services designed to help protect the environment and enhance the time people spend enjoying the outdoors. With an expansive year-round inventory of kayaks, sups, bikes, kayak fishing accessories, paddling clothing, biking accessories, and more, Get Outdoors has established itself as one of the top paddle sports and biking shops in the southeast. They also offer a wide range of kayak safety and technique courses to get you comfortable in your new boat. They'll even get it rigged up for you. Stop by the shop in Greensboro, North Carolina, or check them out at shopgetoutdoors.com.
Whether you're a Ned Rig vet or a finesse fishing noob like me, Jade's Jigs is your source for high quality finesse jigs that raise the bar by being lead free. Using a tin bismuth alloy not only makes Jade's Jigs eco-friendly, it also makes the jig lighter so you get the same profile with less weight for the fish to feel. Check out jadesjigs.com, that's J-A-D-E-S-J-I-G-S.com to see their full lineup of jigs, styles, and colors. And since you're a Faith and Fishing listener, you can save 10% on your order by using promo code FNF10 at checkout. Another huge thank you to Will for coming on the show and sharing his story with us and uh, talking about church planting and and trout fishing. And uh, uh, Will's links will be in the show notes if you want to follow his adventures. Um, don't forget to click the All Things Faith and Fishing link to uh, check out the new merch, uh, the, um, the sponsor links, all that good stuff, uh, YouTube, uh, social media where you can sign up for the... Uh, the giveaway by by uh, commenting on the uh, the post about the the five thousand listeners. So um, yeah, and uh, be sure to to check out the Stopping to Think podcast. Um, that is going to do it for this episode. Y'all take care and God bless. Thank you for listening to the Faith and Fishing podcast. Faith and Fishing is produced and hosted by me, Cam Steele, and is sponsored by Jade's Jigs, Get Outdoors Pedal and Paddle, Savior Outdoors, Atollis, and Mr. B Lure Company. Be sure to give us a rating and a review and to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. That's going to do it for this episode. Y'all take care and God bless. <laughs>